Lord, we do, before anything else, again just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your grace, all of your goodness, all of your mercy shown to us. You are just so kind and so generous. And Lord, we, we come to worship, but it just seems so inadequate what we can give back to you in relation to what you have poured out upon us. But we just really do want to say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Your bride will come together and we'll sing your beautiful.
Let's pray. Father, we submit ourselves to your word. And as we choose to do that, would you speak? Would you reveal? Would you minister? In Jesus' precious name, amen. I want to share a passage that I believe is relevant to where God is calling us and commanding us. Sometimes God gently draws and woos us into things, but I believe God is calling and commanding us into the final part of Romans chapter 13. So if I don't give you something that's all organized and systematic this morning, please forgive me. I'm a mess, but I'm a glorious mess. But I just feel that that is where God is stirring right now. So from verse 8 of Romans 13, Oh, nothing to anyone. And the verse before that he's been saying, don't owe the government, don't owe, don't owe people just with, with things like honor and all of these sort of things. And I know it's easier said than done, but I believe now is not a time to be going into extra debt in the Lord. I really believe it's not a time to be clocking up debt, especially on luxuries and non-essentials. And that will be a very, very good thing to be doing our best in the year or so ahead to be 
getting out of debt as much as we can. But he says, owe nothing to anyone, financially but also spiritually. Owe nothing to anyone in terms of unforgiveness, broken relationships. As I say, the, the verse before even speaks about dishonor, I think. So it touches every part of our lives. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. What a statement. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law in Matthew 5.17. He says, don't think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. How did Jesus fulfill the law? He fulfilled the law through his obedience of love. How do you fulfill every single word of Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, how do you transfer your obligation to God from the law of sin and death and transfer that to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? How do you do it? Through being obedient to the one command that Jesus gave us, to love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5.14 is the most incredible, all-inclusive verse. For the whole Law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law. Verse 9 of Romans 13, jumping back. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then verse 10 says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 11, do this, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is near to, nearer to us than when we first believed. There's never been a more urgent and pressing need to know the time than the time we're in right now. Many Christians waft around in this clueless, very dangerous no man's land of being a little bit sort of disconnected from the world, but also at the same time not fully connected to God. They're in the no man's land. And yes, God does want to keep you up to date with, with what's going on in the world, but not to be caught up and obsessed with it all. If your primary source of conversation is how bad things are in this country, or Israel, or the Ukraine, then you are still very much connected to this world. Be in the world, but not of the world. Be totally, fully disconnected from the world and the things of the world, and fully connected to God. Yes, it's important to have some prophetic understanding of the times, but it's much, much more important to have an understanding of God. And the test of that is, when last did you personally receive revelation from God? When last did you clearly hear His voice? There should not be a day that goes by that you're not personally hearing from the Lord. Not something you got on some WhatsApp message or some little thing or that I put on the church group or Martin put on, but me personally hearing from God. Whether through his word or by personal unveiling and revealing of his heart to you. I'm reminded of those men in, in the tribe of Issachar, 1 Chronicles 12, who were very few in numbers, but they were so valuable to the nation of Israel because they had understanding of the times. And that doesn't mean they were reading the newspapers every day and watching CNN and BBC and whatever. They had prophetic understanding of the times because they had revelation from God and they knew how that fitted in to God's purposes and God's plans. I'm not someone who gets lots of pictures from the Lord. My whole working career was to do with words. So I'm much more of a word person than a picture person and I'm very very especially not a numbers person. I've detested numbers my whole life. 
But I remember a few years ago having a picture of a group of people standing around in their pajamas while the terrifying masses and hordes of hell were heading in their direction. And I felt the Lord saying at that time that it was a picture of much of his church in this day, either fast asleep or at the very best, standing around in their pajamas in no man's land, discussing the Middle East or the rugby or even the latest Christian book. But ignorance of the urgency of the times they're living in. It's the hour to awaken from your sleep. It is the hour to awaken from your sleep. Not in four months' time when you're making New Year's resolutions, but it is now the hour to awaken from your sleep. Awaken from the slumber of passivity, the sleep that has come from believing the lies of the enemy for so long. Awaken from the days of double-mindedness and confusion. And God says this morning, Wake up. This is the time in which you once and for all need to stop trying to justify, sanctify, and spiritualize your passivity and your inactivity. Many, many years ago, Helen wrote and taught a number of times about Queen Esther. (laughs) And two very significant verses in the book of Esther, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes, stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was, when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, that she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the the scepter. And the reason for that in chapter 4 is that Mordecai goes to Esther and he says, Haman is plotting to kill all of the Jews. And she doesn't say, well, thanks for sharing that. We'll make it a matter of prayer and we'll really try and pray about it, brother. No. She wakes up. She's spurred to action. She seizes the prophetic revelation that perhaps she has attained royalty and favor just specifically for this very purpose. And she presses in beyond her fears, full well, knowing that according to the law, anyone who comes uninvited into the king's presence dies if the king doesn't extend that royal scepter to her. But she goes, she makes her request known to the king, and she saves the whole nation of Israel. If you can tell me with absolute certainty that you know you are not called into the kingdom for this very time, this very season, this very year, this very thing, then you let off the hook this morning. But the rest of us need to be awakened, to be stirred, shaken into an expectation that this is the very time and the very reason and season for which God called me into the kingdom. We need to realize that whenever we touch something of God's purpose, whenever we catch a vision of heaven, whenever we see something to God's kingdom and God's will, we always touch conflict. As soon as we grasp something of the significance of God's purpose, then we meet intense resistance. And that resistance has a name in Scripture. The Bible calls that resistance Antichrist. anti Christ. And it will always attempt to compromise or totally destroy the will and the purposes of God in your life. I really want to urge you to go and read the whole book of John in this coming week where it speaks much about the spirit of Antichrist and also much about our urgent need to love one another. We need to awaken from our sleep. We need to reorder our lives according to the purpose of God. As Christians, we've been preached at for so long that we deceive ourselves into thinking that just because we know something to be true, that we are then automatically ordering our lives according to that truth. (laughs) Knowing something doesn't mean you're living right now by what you know. Be on your guard against heaping up for yourself messages and teachings that never go any further than your brain. 
I think it's months and years probably since I actually went and sought for a teaching on the internet. Sometimes people send me a teaching and I feel obliged to look at it. But Receiving the word into your brain will do nothing for you. The word has to get right through into our hearts where it will change us. God wants us to begin to order our lives according to what we claim to agree with. We've been taught way beyond our level of obedience. We don't live a tenth of what we say we believe. Before we've even begun to put one teaching into practice, we're already scurrying around looking for the next one to try and tickle our ears. And remember, one of my favorite things that I think I've probably taught more more over the years than anything else is that in God's eyes, partial obedience is disobedience. And go to good old 1 Samuel 15 to see that in in Saul's life. But God, I did this, but God, I did that. And just one little thing, Saul, that you didn't do. Partial obedience is just as bad as full disobedience. And there is a day of visitation of the Lord coming very soon. I believe even in the coming year that we're heading into. Will you be awake and fully prepared and ready? Will you be fully connected to him? Or will you miss that day of visitation because you're still frantically running around trying to buy oil somewhere? Believe a very, very other now scripture is Psalm 110 from verse 1 to 3. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people offer themselves willingly. Oh, that we may just offer ourselves willingly in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. And God would say, don't miss his day of visitation. If you're not awake and fully clothed in the beauties of holiness, and if you're not willingly offering yourself to God in the day of his power, you will never be able to rule in the midst of his enemies. You'll just be overwhelmed. Ephesians 4, 14 to 21, for this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Therefore be careful. How you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in rugby results, weather reports, the crime situation, what's going on. No. Psalms, hymns. Spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And then the last half of Romans thirteen eleven says, For now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. And that word salvation doesn't just mean being saved. You got saved or born again. It means full deliverance from the molestation of your enemies. It's the same word that's used in 1 Peter 1.9. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So it's not talking about just initially being saved, but full deliverance, full sanctification. The time of your deliverance from the molestation of your enemies is at hand. And God says, arise and wake up. Not the time to be wafting around in your pajamas. So if you're not going to be in your pajamas, what and how should you be dressed? Verse 13, uh, 12 sorry, of, of Romans 13. The night is almost gone. Hopefully you're not walking around in your pajamas. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife 
and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to all of its lusts. So what is this passage saying? It's saying it's awaken from your sleep. Lay aside every deed of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Walk in the light. Avoid all evil behavior and even the appearance of evil. Be especially careful to avoid strife and jealousy. To not be guilty of it. To not stir it up in other people. To not be competitive and divisive. To not be a bearer of bad tidings of strife and jealousy with other people and go and tell someone else. But it just says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. And that covers a multitude of things and areas where we need to be making sure, day by day, hour by hour, that you're not making provision for the flesh. Romans 8.12 says, We are no longer, longer under obligation to live according to the flesh. But we are under obligation to live according to the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What exactly does that mean? How do you put on Jesus? The first thing we need to understand about putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is that you are putting on His Lordship. You're giving up your, the lordship of your life and you are putting on his lordship of your life. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and first, is first and foremost submitting to his full lordship in every little nook and cranny of your lives. And part of the putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is demonstrating, it says, the lordship of Jesus by the way we live, by overcoming sin, self, Satan. If we're not living in such a way as to demonstrate the preeminence of Jesus Christ over those three enemies, then we have not yet put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ means that in every situation, it's simply not my will, but yours be done. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Fully yielding to his lordship. In him, I live and I move and I have my very being. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is you taking personal responsibility to ensure that nothing in your life is outside of the full lordship and authority of Jesus Christ. Now, if you go back two verses in Romans 13 to verse 12, you'll find that Paul also says, put on the, 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 the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus and put on the armor of light. What is the armor of light? By now we should know and have realized that God has not given us anything outside of and apart from Jesus Christ. We should know that God's answer is always Jesus. God's provision is Christ. God's way is Christ. God's victory is Christ. So our overcoming is not bound up with a piece of armor, real or imaginary. It's not without significance that just after saying, put on the armor of light, Paul goes on to then say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be able to see the connection and to see he's talking about exactly the same thing. Jesus Christ is the armor of light. To put on the armor is to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not a huge leap for us to connect Romans 13 directly to Ephesians 6 and to realize that the whole armor of God is a man. Who is our righteousness? Who is our peace? And in whom can the gospel of peace be found? Who is our salvation? Who is truth? Who do we need to have our faith and trust in? Who is the word of God and who sent the Holy Spirit. He is each individual piece of that armor and he is the whole armor. I've seen grown men looking absolutely ridiculous as they put on car cardboard armor and hold up funny stupid little plastic swords and try to teach people how to go through the motions of putting on the full armor of God every morning. 
absolutely ridiculous. Put on the armor is just another way of saying put on Jesus Christ. Full stop. The full armor of God is a glorious picture for us of what the Lordship of Jesus Christ brings into our lives. Anyone trusting in spiritual armor as a thing in, of it, in and of itself is going to fail and fall miserably. Anyone relying on a daily ritual of spiritual warfare and of their particular method of putting on the armor of God, you sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later, are going to be defeated. Why? Because God hasn't given us a formula or a method or a way of doing it. He's given us his son. He doesn't give us a ritual or a ceremony to follow. He says, just put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you have fully put on Christ and his lordship, then you have fully put on the armor of God. Having the Lord Jesus Christ, I have the armor of God. It's not necessary to ask for each piece of armor or to confess anything or do anything. It's only necessary having put on Jesus Christ, the whole full armor of God, to stand therefore, as it says. It's only necessary, having put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to abide then in him and to be determined to let nothing rob you of that abiding. God's only solution to the problem of sin, self, and Satan is to have us put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through him can we make no provision for the flesh. It's only through him. If you've tried, and, and you can tell me that you've succeeded in your own strength in making no provision for the f- uh, flesh, uh, I would probably disagree with you. We dare not make it more complicated than the Lord has made it. To constantly focus on our flesh and the enemy and all of that is a, just a huge waste of time. Instead, we need to, and we, we really have got to start seeing and understanding just how glorious the Son of God is. And press deeply, deeply, deeply into Him. Do you have a method or do you have a man? That's the only answer, only question. It's not about me, my flesh, or the devil. It's all about Jesus Christ. And as he is increased in our lives, none of those other things can do anything other than be decreased. Because if Jesus is increasing in you, all the other stuff has to automatically decrease. And as you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the transformation begins to take place. Matthew 17, 2, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothing was pure white, white as light. To be clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ is to be more and more being transfigured. For too long, we, the very ones who claim a heavenly calling, a heavenly citizenship, a heavenly birth, have just lived as normal earthly men. What little light we do have is often hidden beneath a bushel or two. There's no glory that surrounds us. And I'm not talking about an outward display or something fleshy, but a light and a life that demonstrates the presence of Jesus Christ. John 1.4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. If we are abiding in him, then more and more we will be as he is. If we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are automatically being changed into his likeness. We are being made into his image. And we are in the process all the time of being transfigured. After some time following the Lord, we shouldn't have to stop and ask one of the most ridiculous questions. What would Jesus do? Or wear the little arm. I hope nobody here this morning has got (laughs) the little WWJD. If we are being transfigured, then that light and that life is in us. And it will respond spontaneously and effortlessly to any situation that God causes you to have to deal with. 
You're not going to have to stop and say, oh, what would Jesus do here? We don't have to ask what Jesus would do because we know what to do because he himself is doing it through us. The one who said, I am with you always, also said, I will be in you. You might ask why Peter, James, and John were selected to come apart into that high mountain alone with Jesus to witness this revealing. A much better question is, how can I be included in that remnant? And the issue is, have I seen the Lord? Have we at least once ascended up the mountain and just caught a glimpse of his glory? Have we at least once seen the Son of Man transfigured into the Son of God? Eventually all the disciples saw that glory, but in Peter, James, and John we have a type, a picture of the overcomer. Those who see the glory now, those who are not hanging around waiting for a future inheritance or a future reward, but are standing now for the will and the kingdom in advance of all of its future fulfillment. Moment by moment, hour by hour, we are being changed. And I've probably had the greatest week of change this past week that I've had in 40-something years walking with the Lord. You've got to keep on being changed by Him. And the transfiguration is subtle, but it's powerful. How is it brought about? How does God change us? Then as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ more and more and more, we become what we have put on. Very, very simple. In a very, very inadequate example of this, and it really is, as I say, but, but you know, if you're wearing old T-Sav shorts, you remember those horrible T-Sav shorts we used to wear? Kortbrooker. With your knobbly knees sticking out and some flip-flops on your feet, it's very, very hard to be taken seriously. It's very hard to have any kind of authority. People just don't take you all that seriously. But if you've got a smart suit and a silk tie, or even better yet, a big smart army uniform, it changes everything. You've been clothed in some kind of authority. And people begin to take you a bit more seriously. When you put on the Lord Jesus Christ more and more, you become what you've put on. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Exactly the same word that is used of Jesus up on the mountain. Met, you being metamorphosed, same word. Into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. When we see the glory of the Son of God, we're changed by it. We become what we've seen. When we truly see Him as He is in fact, when we behold his glory, we will be smitten to the ground. If what you've seen thus far of the Lord Jesus Christ has not struck you dumb, blinded you, then you haven't even begun to touch his glory. May God illuminate our hearts. May God, even in this coming week, give us deeper, 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 further revelation of the greatness of Jesus that we may be transfigured, transformed, metamorphosed. Do this. What? Love your neighbor. Yeah. But Lord, surely it's a bit more complicated than that. Surely there's some other stuff I can do to earn brownie points. Love your neighbor. Knowing the time that it is already the hour for you all of us, to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Oh God, 
Change us, Lord. And probably for many of us, the greatest change is to just make a decision to be willing to be changed. To take responsibility for some stuff. To just make the time to seek you, to press into you, to put on the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ yet again. And you promise, as we do that, you will change us. Help us, we pray, Lord. Help us to get there. Help us to have fresh oil, fresh, fresh oil, to be filled to overflowing with that fresh oil when you come back for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord.